Cyber and Security Engineering, Lecture 5, next segment. So this um, protocol that we've got here, which is abstracted from SET, is really quite amazing. Um, the customer is given um, some random value, which is the hash of something that he may not be able to check and, and is invited to sign this. This is a little bit like sticking your hand through a wall and signing a piece of paper which is presented to you by somebody on the other side and you don't know what you're signing. And as it happens, at the time that this was proposed, there was another protocol that could have used the same keys that was used to prove stuff. So it could be used, for example, for proof of edge. So here is how these two protocols could be used back to back. Uh, and the basic idea is that if there's a protocol you want to attack, you design another protocol, which can, if it's allowed to reuse the same keys, be used to attack that by fooling the users. So suppose, for example, um, the uh, Mafia sees a protocol like the one on the previous page and they say, right, let's abuse this by having an edge verification system for our porn site. Now, edge verification is proposed from time to time for porn sites. There was a proposal in Britain last year that got abandoned when the practicalities were realized to be um, you know, um, <clears throat> infeasible, but suppose the Mafia had put up such a thing. Then the customer um, wants to see picture 143, please. And so the Mafia then goes to the bank and says, we'd like to buy 10 gold coins, please. And the bank says, fine, that's going to be £7,000, sign X. And the Mafia says to the punter, please prove your edge by signing X. And um, being in a, a state of arousal and anticipation, he doesn't think too carefully and he produces a digital signature on X, which the Mafia then relay back to the bank. And so the bank say, fine, Mr. Customer, um, here's your seven gold coins. And the Mafia, who control the communications, have, of course, given him their uh, postal address rather than his for delivery. And uh, a month later, when the customer gets his credit card statement, he's in for a, a rather rude awakening. So that's an example of how security doesn't compose, that even if you have got a protocol that's secure, you can sometimes attack it um, by devising another protocol if key reuse is allowed. And you've got to be very, very careful if you allow other people to reuse your authentication protocols or your secrets um, in systems that they control. Now we're going to change gear and we're going to look at bugs. Because as you may have figured out by now, um, one of the um, downsides of working in the computer business is that you'll spend an awful lot of the rest of your life finding bugs in the code that you've written and in the code that other people have written. And in fact, the post-war founder of the computer laboratory, Sir Morris Wilk, said in his memoirs that um, a few months after they got the EDSAC going, he paused once at the corner of the stairs when it struck him with great force that much of the rest of his professional life would be spent um, finding bugs in his own code. And the prevalence of bugs is um, one of the main constraints on the economics of security, and it's a major constraint on security and on safety and on real-time operation. So we have to understand bugs, we have to study them systematically, and um, so we're going to look at a number of uh, different types of bug now. We're going to look firstly at bugs that have effects on safety. And then towards the end of this lecture, in the next segment, we'll look at bugs that have got an effect on security. There's a number of different types of bug. There are bugs in arithmetic. Uh, there are syntactic bugs and there are logic bugs. And then there are bugs which aren't so much around in the code itself as around the code. And there are many of these, but I'm going to discuss two, code injection and usability traps. As my um, <clears throat> safety example of an arithmetic bug, um, let's talk about the Patriot missile. This was a surface-to-air air defense missile that the Americans developed in the 1980s, initially to shoot down incoming planes, but then they improved its performance so that it could shoot down incoming surface-to-surface um, -surface missiles as well. And in the Iraq war in um, 1991, when Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded Kuwait in order to steal their oil reserves, um, President Bush Sr. of the USA put together a coalition involving uh, Britain and other NATO parties and a number of Arab countries um, to throw Saddam Hussein out of Iraq. 
And part of the Iraqi strategy was to drive a wedge between um, the Western powers and the Arab powers, which they did by attacking Israel and at the same time attacking Saudi Arabia and America. And in February 1991, um, the Iraqis started um, have been firing Scud missiles, which were basically like German V2s, but um, a Soviet version slightly improved. And a Scud came through and struck a US barracks in Dahran in Saudi Arabia, leaving 28 soldiers dead. At the same time, other Scuds hit Saudi Arabia and Israel, and the Israelis were so um, wound up at um, Iraqi uh, missiles hitting their cities and killing their civilians, that according to an Israeli I know who um, did his national service in the Air Force there, and new Air Force people there, that Israel came within a smidgen of um, striking back itself and dropping a nuclear bomb on, on Baghdad. So as um, safety-critical bugs go, this is fairly high on the scale. Had circumstances been slightly different, um, this safety failure, um, this arithmetic bug, could have led to hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of casualties. And what went wrong was that it was a bug in the arithmetic. The Patriot missile's um, uh, navigation and attack system measured the time in tenths of a second, which was truncated uh, from binary, which the binary value is 0 0.00110011 repeating. And when the system had been upgraded from air defense to anti-ballistic missile capability, they had to increase the accuracy because the maximum speed uh, of an incoming target um, increased from something around 1,500 miles an hour to something like 5,000 miles an hour. Uh, the Scud missiles came in at about 3,000 miles an hour. Um, the um, nav attack system was written in assembly code, and in fact I worked on a similar system, the Tornado system, back in the mid-70s. So this is an example that's kind of close to my experience. And when you're dealing with assembly code, um, you don't have the same kind of tools to, for example, find all the instances of a particular constant or the, all the instances of a variable at a particular time. You've got to eyeball the code and look for it. And they didn't manage to patch it everywhere. Now, as a result, by the time the Patriot missile had been in operation for 100 hours, different modules um, in the code had gone out of step by a third of a second. And if you've got a missile that's traveling at 2,000 miles an hour and an incoming target that's traveling at 3,000 miles an hour, you know, um, a third of a second is an enormously long distance. And of course, the missiles missed their target. Now, should this have been found in testing? Well, yes, it should have been. But the specification only called um, for tests to be run for four hours at a time. And the people who wrote that uh, testing spec obviously hadn't anticipated that on the battlefield, you can't expect a frontline unit to turn off and reboot its system every four hours if they're constantly terrified of being under attack. There's a number of things we can learn from this. The first is that um, critical system failures typically are multifactorial. They involve a number of factors because the simple ways in which things can fail um, have been ruled out um, by the um, thorough testing that's done of such systems. Uh, the second is um, that it's useful to have um, tools to um, parse the code and understand it. So it's useful to um, write in high-level typed languages so that if you have to do a, a search and replace throughout the code, you can find all the instances of a particular type of variable or a particular type of constant. And the third point is that bugs of this type can be very, very difficult um, to eradicate completely, even once everybody knows about them. Um, to this day, it is the case that the Boeing 787, Boeing's latest product offering, has to be rebooted every 51 hours or it becomes unsafe. And this only came out last year. Now, for background, uh, back in the 1970s when I was working in the Tornado's nav attack system, that only kept its um, um, accuracy for seven to eight hours before the um, accumulated errors started to wander off. And at the time that was secret because tornadoes could conceivably fly longer missions than that with mid-air refueling. Uh, but now that all the tornadoes worldwide have been retired from service, I presume I can say that without risking being thrown in jail. The next type of bug after, after arithmetic bugs are syntactic bugs. And by this we mean bugs that arise from the features of a specific language. Um, strongly typed languages can um, exclude all sorts of errors and they can make other uh, types of error and um, fix easier to uh, deal with. 
uh, but they have side effects. Uh, Java, for example, you're all familiar with, and um, you should be able to see uh, that if uh, in Java you evaluate 1 plus 2 plus um, quote space quote, uh, then you're going to get um, quote 3 quote, because you start off with an integer which then gets forced into a string. If, on the other hand, you start with quote space quote plus 1 plus 2, then since you've forced that into being a string, what happens is not addition but concatenation, and so you end up with quote 1, 2. Here's a slightly more tricky example I've got for you to think about. Um, can anyone explain um, the difference in output uh, between the two expressions at the bottom of this slide? 